Anyone here need God's help? That'd be all of us, wouldn't it? That'd be all of us. The passage read earlier from Isaiah 40 tells us how God comes to our aid. Verse 31, and those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. I think these three statements probably need a little explaining. But first, I want to look at what the passage says about the Lord on whom we call. The one on whom we're encouraged to wait. Verse 22. He stretches out the heavens like a curtain. Verse 23. He reduces rulers to nothing and makes the judges of the earth meaningless. Verse 26. He is the one who has created these stars, the one who leads forth their host by number and calls them all by name. Verse 28, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. Verse 29, he gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases strength. Before identifying the help God gives, Isaiah brings before our minds the greatness and the grandeur, the majesty and the power of our God. And how well the songs Jason chose for today express that as we sang in worship. He begins this passage with the rhetorical questions in verse 21. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the vault of the earth. First and foremost, this God who comes to our aid is the one and only, the eternal, everlasting, all-powerful, and eternal creator of the cosmos. There is nothing that he cannot do. Nothing. This is the one we call on to come to our aid, to meet our needs. What needs do you have today that you would lay before him? There's only one condition for needs being met. Wait for the Lord. Verse 31, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. The great British Baptist preacher of over 100 years ago, Alexander McLaren, said that this, quote, wait for the Lord is, and I quote, Old Testament dialect for what in the New Testament phraseology is meant by believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. For the notion expressed here by waiting is the expectant dependence. And the New Testament faith is the very same in its attitude of expectant dependence. While the object of the Old Testament wait, Jehovah, is identical with the object of New Testament faith, which fastens on God manifest in the flesh in the man, Jesus Christ. And we come to express our need in faith. In expectant dependence, Jesus teaches us to ask in his name. Dr. Jim Dennison, co-author of the book I encouraged you to find last week, Awaken My Heart, says that asking in Jesus' name is like writing a check to be drawn on Jesus' account, knowing that he will give what he knows is best. So the prerequisite is to wait on the Lord, to come in faith, through faith in Jesus Christ with expectant dependence. And the promise is threefold. Those who wait, mount up with wings like eagles. 
Run and not get tired. Walk and not become weary, or as the King James says, not faint. The second and third, run and walk, make some logical sense. But the first, this mount up with wings like eagles, is a little bit more mysterious. What in the world could this mean? The late Dr. John Claypool said that these three statements suggest three ways God comes to our aid. First, sometimes God comes in miracles. They will mount up with wings like eagles. This suggests rising above circumstances, of being lifted up over the circumstances that we're facing. It suggests a miracle, God intervening on our behalf to alter the situation that we're dealing with. Last week I mentioned the death of Henry Blackaby, the author of Experiencing God. There's a phrase popularized by that study, Experiencing God. It was the phrase, God-sized. Do you remember that, those of you who've studied it? Something that only God can do. It's God-sized. There are many things he leaves for us to do in his strength, but there's some things that only he can do. Maybe a Maybe a ministry vision, maybe an illness, maybe a wayward child, maybe a broken relationship, something about which we might say it will take a miracle. God still works miracles. They're rare. That's why we call them miracles. Do you need a miracle today? Do you have a miracle story to share? Lil and I have a very personal, very special miracle story. It happened 40 years ago. We were five months along in the pregnancy for our third child, the one for whom we prayed and prayed and prayed, didn't think it was ever going to happen. And the doctor said, something's wrong. As he did his measurements, he said, this baby's not growing. And so we began praying. Next month, he said, she hasn't grown any. We've got a problem here. And so he explained to us what his diagnosis was. He called it placenta insufficiency. She was not getting enough nourishment. She wasn't growing. And he said, if this continues term, we're going to have to take her early. She's going to have a better chance in the neonatal nursery than inside you because the brain will be developing in the last month and she'll need to be out of you if that's continuous. So we were anticipating an early C-section to take her to the neonatal nursery. Seven, seven and a half months, eight months, Lil goes in for a visit and he says, I must have been wrong. (laughs) This baby's growing. I must have been wrong. So I'm standing there behind the drape holding Lil's hand as he delivered our third C-section. And then they took her off to the nursery and getting Lil ready to go to the room. And he came to me with this silver stainless steel pan. He said, I want you to see this. He said, this is the placenta. He said, my diagnosis was right. You see this shimmery, silvery part right here? He said, that's how it's all supposed to look. You see this yellowy color over here? He said, that confirms my diagnosis. It was placenta insufficiency. And there's only one you have to thank for this baby. So they're all miracles when we deliver them, aren't they? But she's our very special miracle. Do you need a miracle? God still works miracles. And it's okay to ask for one. We're encouraged to ask. And then trust. But they're rare. They're rare. Maybe one in a lifetime. Maybe none. But it's okay to ask. It is indeed one way that God comes to our aid. Sometimes he alters the circumstances. Gives us wings. And lifts us up over the situation. But then sometimes God comes to us with support, the second way. 
They will run and not get tired. Dr. Claypool called this the way of collaboration. God says no to the miracle, but he comes to us, he walks with us, he empowers us that we might change the circumstances. If they can be changed by our effort, he sustains us in it. He encourages us, empowers us. We are participating with him in what he is doing and doing through us and using us. I read the story years ago, but I made note of it. 2005, during the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, a deputy sheriff in St. Bernard Parish was in charge of a shelter in a high school with 488 people present. And then the floodwaters came. Three feet, then six feet, then eight feet, then 12 feet. And he said, I only lost one. I prayed... Jesus, you have to help me. And he did. Sometimes he comes to us to support us and encourage us in the efforts that we can do. In fact, this is the place where most of life is hammered out. No miracle, no intervention, no escape from the duties of life or the challenges that we face. God's presence and power is simply there to guide us. In doing the normal stuff, parenting, growing up, dealing with unpleasant people and unpleasant circumstances, career challenges, financial challenges, personal spiritual growth challenges, ministry opportunities, misunderstandings, all the normal stuff that we deal with. And God doesn't come miraculously and fix all those things. He gives us his wisdom and direction and insight and power and perseverance so that we can deal with those things and we can change the circumstances that we face. He is ready to empower us to accomplish his purposes in every issue we face. Nothing is beyond the range and scope of his concern for us. In our work advancing the kingdom of God. We can't do it on our own. He uses our hands, our feet, our minds, our lips, our tongues, our minds. But he empowers us to do the work. Like the focus for last Sunday, praying for spiritual awakening. God could work a miracle, couldn't he? He could change every heart on this planet. But he's left it to us to bear witness and to intercede. We are collaborators with him. So the question is, are we trusting? Are we waiting upon the Lord for the power to run and not get tired? That's where we live. That's where we are today. And finally, sometimes God comes to us to give endurance. They will walk and not become weary, or as the King James Version says, not faint. This suggests perseverance, doesn't it? No miracle, no empowering even to work it out. The only option is to persevere and be changed in ourselves by the circumstances that we cannot change and God has not chosen to change. Let me illustrate from one person's experience. One of my best friends at seminary was a fellow named Rod Foster. I'll tell you what kind of friend Rod Foster was. I was writing a paper for a theology class. I remember so vividly it was on the theology of P.T. Forsyth. You've never heard of him. 26 pages, and I've got all my note cards organized. I've got everything I'm going to say in this paper. I've got them all in order, and I start writing. Rod stops by my room. He said, you need any help? I said, well, I'm not sure I'm going to have time to get this typed by 8 a.m. Rod stayed up all night with me that night. I would write a page or two. He'd come by and grab it and go back to the typewriter. He hit the last key about 7, 7.30. I washed my face. Didn't need to get dressed. Headed to class, turned in the paper, and went back and fell in bed. That was my friend Rod. 
I was in his wedding about a year before Lil and I got married. He chose to transfer from Southwestern Seminary in Fort Worth to Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. And about eight or nine months, I guess, after we were married, Rod was diagnosed with cancer. About a month before Rod died, I flew to Louisville and spent the weekend with him. I'm sitting there in the hospital room visiting with him, and he said, you know, Cliff, I've discovered that something one of our professors said is true. The question why is a dead-end street. There is no answer. And the only question that can bear fruit is the question, what now? And more specifically, what now, oh God, in my relationship with you? And he said, I'm trying to ask that question. My friend, in the last weeks of his life, was being changed by the circumstances. I doubt if anyone could go through cancer treatment and survive, and maybe even like Rod, not survive, but could bear testimony, this has transformed me. This has changed me. And that's one of the ways God comes to us. Not to miraculously give us wings and we fly over the circumstance because some miracle has changed it. Not even to empower us to do our best in his strength and wisdom to change the circumstances. But simply in trusting him, in yielding to him to be transformed be changed in ourselves by the circumstances. I was thinking about other illustrations and one came to my mind was Johnny Erickson Tata. Dove off a float in a lake at 17 years old, hit her head, broke her neck, paralyzed from the neck down for the rest of her life. She's 74 years old today, still living. And it's a painful life, I'm told. She's written books. She became an artist. You've seen pictures of her with the, with the brush in her teeth, painting pictures. She's organized a ministry to disabled people, Johnny and friends. She has been changed by the circumstances and been used of God to minister to and to change others and you could share your story as well. I think about my friend Rod, and I think about uh, the losses in my life, and you can think about the losses in your life, and we face the reality that death is the final circumstance. No miracle since Lazarus. Jesus' resurrection was different. He didn't die again. Nobody gets brought back to life. Death is the final circumstance. No miracle, no empowering. Only to hear his words, my grace is sufficient for you. He is with us in the midst of whatever it might be. When it can't be changed, we can be changed. He's in the transforming business, making us better making us more like Jesus. And as you reflect on some of the challenges that might have been opportunities for him to make you better and to change you, we need to remember that in trusting him, we need to guard against being bitter when things don't change. Let him make us better. So what circumstances are you facing today? You're praying for a miracle? Go ahead. You have that right, that freedom. Are you trusting him and allowing him to work in you so that with your hands, with your minds, with your words, with your actions, you can affect the circumstances to his honor and glory? Are you facing something that just refuses to be changed? 
by miracle or by your effort. But God has a plan to change you, to make you better. What are you facing today?